this is Harry Nelson. I'm uh, really happy to be here today with Hillel Kamiansky for uh, a program that we hope will be uh, be valuable to everybody. Just in advance of the program, I just want to say um, uh, as I feel obligated as the lawyer on this presentation to say that this is an educational program. It's not intended to be constitute legal advice or to be the basis of forming an attorney-client relationship. Um, uh, we're happy to have everybody here, and uh, we're going to get started. So the program today is called Preparing to Sell Your Behavioral Health Program, uh, What to Expect in the Process. And uh, uh, I'm speaking here today on behalf of Nelson Hardiman, ha very happy to be here with Hillel Kamiansky from Adaptive Health Capital, and uh, we're proud to be putting on this program as part of uh, BHAP, the Behavioral Health Association of Providers. Um, uh, just as a little bit of background, um, uh, uh, my work has been focused very heavily on behavioral health, uh, both regulatory and transactional work, uh, defending investigations uh, and litigation, but working extensively to try to support uh, behavioral health providers, uh, and, um, and I've been writing extensively about that subject. I wanted to turn it over to Hillel to talk a little bit about uh, himself and uh, adaptive health capital. Thank you, Harry. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, name is Hillel Kamiansky. I'm the COO and CFO of Adaptive Health Capital. Uh, Adaptive Health Capital provides expert industry focus, insight, and strategic guidance, crucial in identifying, negotiating, and more importantly, closing transactions in the healthcare and life science space. So what that means is we help sellers locate buyers and assist them through the entire merger and acquisition process. On the buy side, buyers looking, we create industry-focused reporting to assist them with identifying the right opportunities as well. So multiple types of services focused through on mergers and acquisitions, financial strategy, and bridge financing as well. Um, through the changes in the industry, the disruption in healthcare, we've seen a lot of opportunities in the behavioral health space, which we thought would be very apropos today to discuss as you have this influx of buyers looking for behavioral health programs, as well as sellers looking to take, op take, take the opportunity and discuss to see what their programs are really valued at today. So just to give you a quick overview of what we're going to be covering in the next hour, um, we're going to spend a little bit of time at a high level talking about how different waves of the behavioral health industry have seen uh, uh, different trends, um, and, and, and differences in uh, uh, transactions and M&A activity, merger and uh, acquisition activity in different segments. Um, we want to contextualize this uh, within the unfolding nature of transformation in behavioral health over the past uh, decade uh, and to share some high-level lessons. And then uh, the presentation is going to shift much more into the details of how to think about transactions, how to think about different kinds of buyers and sellers and we're gonna go through transaction readiness, what that means, what, it, what the pitch and the pitch book look like, how to think about strategic um, acquisitions versus uh, uh, financial acquirers, um, and some of some process aspects, negotiation and documentation of the deal, due diligence, um, and definitive documentation. So with that, I just wanna say a word about, um, uh, when we talk about behavioral health, we're talking about a, a, a broad swath of activity. Um, and uh, um, this graph, by the way, does not intend to have any kind of science. It was more of a, um, a, an artistic description of what we've seen happening in the industry, which is to say that there has been since 2008, which we take as a very significant marker from the expansion of um, coverage for mental health and addiction treatment services as a result of the Federal Mental Health Parity Act, um, there has been a, a, a just enormous growth and transformation in the industry. Um, and there have been periods where substance use disorder treatment was really driving merger and acquisition activity, and we've seen that, we've seen that changing. And so, uh, for example, uh, medication-assisted treatment, MAT, has become a much larger focus over the, uh, over the last few years. Developmental disability, such as autism treatment, has become a much bigger feature of the a much more active space. Um, and we see what, what, what's important, I think, to take away is that there are, there, there's a lot of, of, of dynamism and, and change as to what uh, a, a pro, a potential investors and buyers are looking for in the market. And to, uh, we start, we're seeing spaces like autism spectrum disorder 
and uh, uh, programs for at-risk youth also uh, to be underserved areas and, and then er the, you know some some challenges in the substance use disorder space as there have been um, there have been changes and so what what's driving those changes if we at a high level uh, what, what, we, what we really want to highlight is broader healthcare trends and the broad trend of the last 10 years in healthcare has been a move towards lower acuity settings of care, meaning that we're seeing less focus on inpatient broadly. There are exceptions where particular sectors may not have, we may have closed too many psychiatric hospitals, for example, and there may be opportunities. Uh, but, but in general, what we've seen certainly with regard to substance use disorder is pressure for lower acuity settings of care, meaning less residential, more outpatient, and a growth in telehealth. And th those are, that is a trend that we expect to continue largely because it's being driven by outside factors in healthcare. We also wanted to just call attention to a little bit of the, of the, uh, um, the historics of the last few years, right? I mentioned mental health parity in 2008. Uh, the, the real driver of growth was uh, the, the Affordable Care Act, including substance use disorder coverage as a minimum essential benefit required to be covered by every health plan in the country, Medicaid, employer-sponsored plans, commercial plans, uh, which was a huge driver of growth across behavioral health uh, and initially so strongly in substance use disorder treatment. Um, we've seen the problems of fraud and abuse emerging in recent years around urine drug screening, around marketing kickbacks, and those have continued to be a, um, an obstacle and a challenge uh, to uh, the transactional market. Uh, we've seen the opening of new, uh, new coverage, uh, medic the Medicaid market opening up, um, and uh, as we mentioned, expanding um, challenges of you know, more, more services, more claims, and then uh, sort of on the other side, resistance in the form of more payer scrutiny of claims, payer audits, um, continued pressure, downward pressure on reimbursement. And the question is, what's coming ahead? Uh, one of the trends, and we, we because this is a, in our program, we don't have time to, to delve into it deeply in this program, but one of the things that we're forecasting is much more acceleration of value-based models of reimbursement, driving realignment, and driving the market. We wanted to uh, share just a few high-level lessons, not to keep you waiting until the very end of the program, on what we're seeing, lessons of deals that we've been involved in uh, um, and, and had direct experience with. So if we, I, I picked sort of five high-level lessons that we would focus. One is that regulatory compliance is driving value in merger and acquisition transactions like never before, meaning for to a large extent, transactions were historically driven by financials. If you looked at the financials, you might, you might know how well a program is doing and, and be able to uh, determine the level of interest from buyers and, 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 and the pricing. What we're seeing is that regulatory compliance, having a re compliance program has become such a huge priority because of challenges in, uh, re in reimbursement, relationships with payers, and all of the changing laws and regulations, um, and a lot of fear about what are the, uh, you know, what are the skeletons in the closet. Um, one of the big lessons for us, and we'll talk more about this in the program, has been the need for pre-diligence. That is not to wait till you're well inside along in a transaction to discover the weak points. The importance for uh, buyers to be focused on identifying those issues in advance, sellers to be ident identifying those issues in advance, and, and disclosing them and figuring out how to do so. Um, and this ties into the third point that we have here, uh, the need to do your homework on the issues that are going to come up in a transaction and figuring out how to disclose them in a way that builds trust proactively. Uh, reimbursement has become a huge, huge issue. We've seen a massive shift uh, over the last several years from a largely out-of-network uh, uh, billing, for by, particularly in substance use disorder treatment, to uh, the increasing value of in-network contracts with health plans as a driver of value. And finally, uh, you know, going back to the first slide, the way that supply and demand has become such a driver in particular segments, in particular geographies, and uh, a driver of value in transactions. Yeah, uh, Harry, I'll just add uh, to that part of the slide, uh, especially in the pre-diligence stage. Um, we see this a lot where um, people rush to, and we're going to discuss this in detail uh, in a few slides from now, but people rush to get an LOI, or it's a letter of intent out, and what happens is that uh, people get excited, they want to get an, uh, a letter of intent executed by the seller right away, and it doesn't address any of the issues um, that will come up in diligence. And what happens is that now the seller is locked into a, 
it's in agreement for X amount of days and things will come up and that will, that will put pressure, that might put pressure on the purchase price and box the seller into a corner later on. And we'll discuss some of those as well. So it's very important from a seller perspective to learn about the buyer and vice versa. So more important than that is also, uh, as Terry mentioned, there's a book, big push now for in-network contracting. And if you're not in network today, then the question comes up, why not? And there could be a reason. Maybe you're, you're, you're more of a private pay uh, focused uh, facility, but it's a lot easier for a buyer to forecast if they have in network contracts than if you don't. And that will come up in a price, in a purchase price as well. And that will affect the purchase price as well. Um, I think we can move on to the transaction readiness of this part of the, of this, of the program. Transaction readiness. So, um, so now uh, as, a buyer, as a seller, you decide to sell. So now the fun begins, right? The question is, the first one is really operating self-assessment or I like to call it introspection. You know, why are you selling? Um, understand why you're selling. And there could be multiple reasons for that, which we'll discuss. But it's important that you identify all the skeletons that may be in your closet. Get them out in the open. I'm not saying to disclose all of them, but just get in front of them right away. And then through, with your transaction advisor, you will discuss what pertinent information you should be disclosing ahead of time and what you may, can maybe leave on as you get closer to an executed letter of intent. Um, more importantly, what is your secret sauce? What is your advantage, right? What's your competitive advantage? What makes you different than other facilities in a particular region or overall? So understand why, what makes you different and highlight those items as well. Um, some other uh, points here are financial review. Have your balance sheets, have your P&L, your profit and loss up to date and available. Have your historical financials up to date. This will come up and this will slow down a transaction. Just a couple of notes to add uh, uh, on this. It's, it's impossible to stress enough how important this work by sellers is. I can tell you, uh, firsthand that we've seen the value of transactions change radically based on sellers knowing what they've got. In some cases, that analysis actually leads to action. We've had cases where a program that was less attractive as a bunch of, a bundle of, of combined services for different segments became much more attractive by shedding some of the, the, the less performing services or in some cases services that had compliance issues with them and becoming a purer cleaner offering on the market and we have seen cases where uh, where the the sale price literally uh, tripled and quadrupled on the basis of the work done by the seller before the transaction to really understand and make sure that what they were bringing to market was something that was going to be attractive that's a great point we just had a we just had a recently with a transaction where um, the seller had really all four levels of care uh, at, uh, inpatient out of patient but the, his, his drive was the, the PHP and LP, which we'll discuss what those terminology means a little bit later, but really the outpatient was their focus, but they did have a segment for inpatient work, but it wasn't as strong as his outpatient. And it was lucrative for one particular buyer to the, the more outpatient facility than the inpatient. So it worked out well, just addressing it right away, understanding their concerns, understanding their strengths, and bringing everything forefront um, ahead of time. All right, so we're going to move from transaction yeah. readiness to the pitch. Right, so I mentioned before, why are you selling and why now, okay? Uh, it's important to know, have those answers. You know, there could be multiple reasons why someone is selling. For instance, you know, you've done really well over the last five years and you're ready to cash out. Or it could be that, no, you're, you're currently stuck out of network. You're seeing compression on, on reimbursement and you're trying to move the, that into in-network. Uh, Anthem, let's using Anthem as a as uh, as as an example. Anthem is the 800-pound gorilla in the room, and you're trying to get those contracts. You have yet to get those contracts, and you're feeling the compression uh, overall in your financials. So you're trying to move out of out of that and trying to sell right away. That's also important to know. That should be brought to the forefront as well. Um, again, multiple reasons why you're selling. Just have them up front. Be ready to answer those questions, and just get in front of it as well. Um, also, this kind of leads into the, this, the slide prior. Just be open and transparent with your buyers and with your transaction advisor. Um, I'm not saying to give the keys to the castle right away, but it's important to understand the issues and be ready to answer them. By the way, I can't stress enough, literally in the last year, I can think of four 
separate deals that were on track and were derailed by information being withheld. And in a few cases, we were able to get deals back together after there was a significant discovery, a disclosure or something that, had, uh, that surprised buyers in a negative way. Um, but even when that happened, there were significant concessions, money held back, prices reduced. This is, could not be a more important point. Um, the idea of being clever and holding back information for sellers is a mistake. Really figuring out how to package yourself in the best light is the critical, uh, the critical thing. I totally agree. Um, and then that leads us to the next slide of identifying your buyer. So we have two different types of buyers, uh, two groups of buyers. One would be a strategic buyer and the other one would be a financial buyer, which will be the next slide. But understanding the two is very important. And you don't know who that buyer will be, but you have, it's good to understand who, who, you know, identifying who those buyers could be. So on the strategic buyer, it could be a competitor of yours who really understands the business and who's looking to expand, right? They could, for instance, they could have one program in a certain geographical area where you have three. So that a strategic buyer will understand that, no, I can, through economies of scale, I can be very successful of attaching my, for instance, my medical director to your three programs and reducing the cost, and he can structure a price because it's in, he's incentivized because he understands that basis. Now, on the flip side, you'll have a financial buyer. This could usually falls into, uh, um, you know, a, a private equity, a family office, who's heard all about behavioral health, who understand, uh, yeah, you can flip the slide and we'll go back and forth a little bit, toggle a little bit. But a financial buyer really who's heard all about this, this industry, uh, heard about the multiples in the industry and really wants to get in, but they really don't understand the business. The problem with that is that they'll hold you in diligence for a while until they really understand the business. So while it might be enticing because they might throw a higher multiple at you, it could, be de it could derail you a little bit because they're going to require much more thorough cavity search type of diligence than a strategic buyer who, who understands the business. Um, so do you want to go back to the last uh, um, I, the, the, la the only other point I, I want to, the only point I'd emphasize here as between strategics and financials, it's important to understand that there are different buyers in the market. Somebody who's trying to figure out how you fit into their pre-existing plans versus somebody who's looking to take either to buy a, a program in distress uh, uh, um, with the hopes of, uh, uh, of restoring it and getting it functioning, or somebody who's taking a good working model and wanting to simply grow it and scale it. There's not a right and a wrong here, but it's important to think about how you fit. Uh, are you the missing piece in somebody else's strategic vision, or have you, uh, ha do you, have you built something uh, promising that has scale opportunities for a financial buyer, or, or are you a program uh, that is simply just not functioning and needs to uh, turn over the keys to somebody else. There are, there's not one right type of buyer. Right. It's depends. It's very situationally specific, and you need to. It goes back to the key point of understanding where you are and, and how you're going to fit with prospective buyers. Right, and, and, and just you know, don't you know, your eyes might light up by a certain EBITDA multiple, but again, you got to get through that finish line. And understanding how to get there is more important than than possibly the, the dollar signs that someone throws at you ahead of time. So it's very important to understand the differences. And the, the, I would say the goal is really to get to the finish line, um, and more importantly than you know to be enticed to get there and not actually end up closing. So keep that in mind. So we want to talk about the uh, uh, the non-disclosure agreement, right? This is an important threshold issue in the sense that um, it's very tempting when you meet perspective when you're in in, in the process. Of, uh, of having disclosures to just sort of uh, um, open the kimono and, and start sharing information. Uh, but non-disclosure agreements are an important threshold issue because they help, uh, they, they help define what information is only being provided on a confidential basis and is going to be uh, dis de destroyed, returned, disregarded, and not used if a transaction does not proceed. Um, and, that, and typically that relates to things like financial performance, uh, um, identifying if there are trade secrets in your in your business and in, in your your service delivery and your marketing um, and uh, anything having to do with uh, with with patient records or client records which may of course have HIPAA uh, per, uh, personal health issues so um, the, the non-disclosure agreement is not a one-size-fits-all um, there are uh, uh, mutual non-disclosures in some cases, there, there are one-sided non-disclosures. It's very important to be using the right kind of non-disclosure agreement and to make sure that it addresses certain key issues. Um, and two issues to highlight are um, tail provisions, meaning that even if, when, if the deal is off, 
and the non-disclosure agreement is otherwise terminated, that non-disclosure agreements have provisions in them to have continuing obligations to, to, for secrecy. And also, th this is a, a related issue, which is it's very important to decide who's go going to know about the uh, possibility of, of selling your program. It is often a mistake to allow that information to go beyond uh, the highest level of the organization because any knowledge of a prospective transaction that the ownership is actually thinking about selling and management is in, in, a, in, that, in that frame of mind of even considering it is likely to cause anxiety, if not panic, uh, down the organization and is likely to cause your key and most valuable employees to look around and say, hey, wait a second, um, if this, if, if, do I not have a stable position here? Should I be looking elsewhere? So it's very, very important to consider who should know and to keep that circle as tight as possible until the transaction is a reality. You know, I'll, I'll just add to that, um, you'll have usually an on-site visit by a prospective buyer, and it's important that the employees around know that uh, that this is a, a, essentially a, a ghost run, right? So that nobody knows that this is a particular buy, buyer coming in to check out the facility, but no, this could be a guy looking to lend you a loan or whatever it may be. I wouldn't just disclose that, no, this is a guy looking to buy our facility. Just be very cognizant of when you do an on-site visit and when a buyer comes in to so that people should know and, and, and even the buyer should be told that to only talk to certain employees and when asked to know that this is not really be discreet about really what the visit is all about. By the way, just one thing to say here. The, the, so the point is that you, there should be a point when a transaction is successful where you actually make the disclosure. There is work to do to hold your team together and keep it and keep confidence because as soon as people know about the information, it is going to cause some anxiety. That's just part of this process. The important thing is to, del to delay that because we are throughout the deal until the closing. You don't know that you're going to get there, and right. and so many deals. We, we see deals constantly uh, stall, and, uh, and that just can be such a negative for the workforce. Cool. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about the, the pitch book a little bit. Um, so the pitch book, usually you'll have a transaction advisor prepare that for you, or you might have some pieces internally that you'll already put together. But really the point is that it should be tailored to the right particular buyer. So we mentioned strategic versus a financial buyer. A lot of the historical information will be the same, right? You'll put a summary, you'll put some pictures of the facility, you'll talk about, you'll put an org chart, you talk about the key employees. Um, and, and obviously this will be a confidential deck that you will send out and you won't just send it out to everybody. This will kind of be the process of once someone has an NDA, you'll send them some additional information. I usually start with a one pager, which uh, we didn't really br briefly mention here, but a one pager is a summary of, of your information of who you are, what you are, what you're selling. Uh, that will usually go before a pitch book. But again, the pitch book really is meant to, to highlight the success and to, to inform everybody of, of, of everything that you have and that what you're selling in the organization uh, as a whole, whether it's the op operation as well as the, the property, if you do own that, which we'll touch about, which we'll touch on in a second. Uh, but more importantly, uh, for this particular side is to focus on the type of tailoring you'll do for a particular buyer, whether it's a strategic or a financial buyer. Uh, but for everybody else, right, the information you'll have for both type of buyers or in, in the bitch book would be um, highlight information. We're not saying you need to li limit your census uh, by level, you know, to list your census by levels of care. This will be just more general information, uh, gross and net margins. You want to have financial, historical financial information. Usually three years is, is a good start. Um, as well as do you own any of the, in any of the real estate? That will be key in a transaction as buyers today are looking for some type of asset back if possible uh, so they can buy not only the opco the operation but the propco as well um, finding out the terms of the contract as well in network what does that mean who are who are the contracts with um, i would limit that but at the same time uh, don't go into detail but but you can list as to who you are in contract with by the way, one, just one comment on here. The, the management team, you know, we, we, so many times people talk about the real value of the business is the leadership. And so one of the big questions that comes up is, are, is the existing management going to stick around? Is there going to be leadership that sticks around? And often we find that sellers are not excited about the prospect of sticking around. I, in my experience, it's very important to be able to have at least someone in the leadership who can represent continuity um, at least for some period of time, whether it's for a year, for two years, uh, just to allow the buyer to get confidence that the, 
uh, facility that the, that the you know that the operations are going to transfer smoothly, that the workforce is going to hold together. Um, I think it's a very very important point, and the idea of just walking away and handing the keys over uh, in whole it may be appealing. That sounded kind of a it's like a good image for a for a television program, but it's not yeah. something that I would recommend. It's very important to offer buyers. Uh, um, a, a message of continuity, right. and most buyers will want to do that, and they'll they'll put that in the in the they'll put that in the level level intent as well. So, for instance, they'll they'll mention that we want a certain earnout period to ensure that there's continuity, right? So you'll see that in LOIs as well. So the the concept of a walking away is I, I haven't really seen it today. Maybe uh, maybe there are some deals like that, but for the deals we worked on, somebody always usually stays on for a certain period of time to ensure that continuity. So we wanted to talk about a little bit more about thinking about how you pitch to strategics versus financial uh, buyers. Right. So uh, we, we touched on this earlier. Uh, I would emphasize here the, the economy of scale. It's very important for a strategic buyer, right? You have somebody in the industry, you have someone who owns a, a facility, in maybe not in your geographical location, but somewhere else, and now they're looking to expand to form, um, you know, possibly they might want to roll up later on, and in the meantime, they're in the acquisition mode. They're acquiring different facilities for certain geographical locations. So it's important to know that uh, from, a strategic, from a strategic point of what, where, what regions you're in, how many places, who does that facilitate, they, then they can turn around and look at your financials and, and start cutting away and say, you know what, we've got one medical director, uh, we can shave off fees here and there, we can shave off food costs because we know we have certain uh, people in the industry already and, and this is, uh, will only help us leverage lower costs. That's very important for a strategic investor. From a financial investor, which would be the next slide, again, um, they're focused a lot on EBITDA, right? They want to know how are you doing, are you making money, uh, how do I scale you later on? Are you going to be a model for other facilities I'm going to go out to acquire? Um, they're focused really on top line. Maybe you have a successful contract. I won't go into whether you can transfer that contract because that's, I'll leave that to Harry to discuss. But essentially, what we've seen is a financial buyer will come in and say, hey, you've got a, a, a lucrative contract in one area. Can I take that contract and apply that to other facilities? Whether it will yell that, I, will, I won't discuss that today, but that's something that you, we see financial buyers are interested in as well. We'll, we'll talk about the issue of those tr transfers of contracts yeah. with the diligence part of the presentation. Um, so we want to talk about negotiating, uh, negotiating the deal and the documentation of the deal. Um, beginning with the sort of first step, uh, the letter of intent, what are the key terms in, uh, in the letter? Of I think before I want to discuss the, uh, the type of sale, equity versus asset. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, no, keep, can't keep going. Oh. All right. Yeah. Um, so two different types of sale, equity sale, asset sale. I won't spend too much time on this right now. Um, but but just a, a key key factor is that one is really beneficial or more beneficial for a buyer. One is really more beneficial for a seller. It doesn't mean you're going to get what you want. It doesn't mean how things are going to be presented. But let me just uh, as a, explain sort of the, the for anybody. There's under, it's very important to understand the difference between you know, an equity or a stock sale, a stock purchase on one side, and an asset purchase on the other side. The core difference is that when you when you have an equity or a stock purchase. What you're really doing is you're buying the stock, or if it's an LLC, you're buying the membership interest of the entity under which the seller operates. The buyer is literally stepping into the shoes and becoming the same entity that the seller was. There's no change of entity. That's quite different from an asset purchase, in which case the seller is essentially closing its operations and taking all of the assets that it has. It could be its brand. Uh, its facilities, all, everything that it's got, its goodwill, and it's, it's selling those to a buyer, which is establishing a new organization and a new brand. Um, and, and, the tr and the trade offs in this process, there's not one right way to do it. A stock sale um, generally requires some level of confidence that you're not buying liabilities, right? The big advantage of asset purchases is that if there are liabilities out there, if there, is, uh, ins if there are insurance companies uh, claiming that they're owed back millions of dollars, if there are lawsuits from a patient harm incident or some other liability out there, some risk, an asset purchase cuts off those liabilities, what we call successor liability, and so that a buyer can have confidence that they are taking something without being responsible for the mistakes of the seller. Uh, a, a stock sale 
uh, um, does not offer those benefits, there has to be some other way in a stock sale to give buyers who are worried some confidence. Often there will be some amount held back in an escrow to be paid out over time so that there's monies available um, to, uh, to address any liabilities that come up. Uh, uh, it's a major issue. Um, and it also, some of the other issues that, that tie into this decision are radically different tax treatment, right? There, there, there are different, there are often huge um, tax advantages in, 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 in setting up a, a stock purchase. So the parties have to look at the, at the, at the tax issues. Um, uh, uh, the buyers um, uh, it may, may, you know, may strongly prefer one or the other. Um, and then finally, and the, the middle uh, um, uh, bullet point on the slide, um, the, one of the important issues is the change of ownership, or what we call the chow process. So the change of ownership process is that the, the licensing entity at the state level needs to be notified of the uh, of the change, whether it's a uh, whether the whether there's been a change of the ownership within the the, the, uh, the in the stock sale or whether it's a new a new company coming in and taking over, um, there has to be a, uh, a the state has to be notified uh, with regard to the license of the facility, and then often payers, particularly federal uh, health programs like Medicare and Medicaid, require notice and an approval process. So it's very very important to understand that process to see what's required and to make sure that the appropriate disclosures are made. And those are going to be very different from state to state. And so that's a, a, a big part of choosing whether the transaction should be uh, a stock purchase or an asset purchase. Generally, that's a conversation. Making this decision and thinking through these issues is something that should be done with legal counsel um, early in, into the deal process. Yeah, I'll, I'll add, this kind of ties into this slide and the next slide is that um, on an asset sale, we you know one of the bullet points says that skips for buyers is a step up in basis. One, um, one point that, that comes up a lot when you have an operation and a property that you're selling as well, the opco propco combo, is that how much is assigned to the operation and how much uh, value is assigned to the property? This is fair market value, and then you need an appraisal for that. Just to be clear, by the way, for anybody, I, I, um, I got a little nervous with EBIT. Uh, people know that that means earning for interest tax depreciation. But so so when, 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 what Hill is referring to, OPCO, PROPCO, is that when there is real estate owned, it's generally um, prefer, a preferred practice to have one entity own the real estate called a prop, property company or a propco, and one company control the operations, the licensed uh, uh, operation of the facility, the operating company, or the opco. To keep them separate. But at the same time, when you're purchasing it, the question is how much can you assign to one or the other, right? So there's, a, there's advantage, advantageous for a particular seller, for instance, to have more more um, more value assigned to the real estate, for, for, for instance, because of the lower tax basis, lower, lower uh, tax liability on a real estate than there is on the operation. Those are discussions you should have with your, 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 your tax accountant, but that's just something to keep in mind when you're looking at an overall purchase price, how much is going to be assigned to one over the other piece. Uh, other issue, other LOI issues, um, uh, you know, we'll discuss the purchase price is very important. How much cash up front, how much earn out, earn out, which are usually associated with staying on, right? So uh, continue that continuity. They want to make sure that the business is not only running smoothly today and hitting their numbers today, but once that, own, that transfer ownership happens, how do we ensure that we're going to hit those milestones? And that's one way to ensure by, by having the owner stay on, the former owner stay on, and receive an earnout for that as well. Also, liability holdbacks, uh, what's going to be held back, how are you going to purchase that, what happens, uh, you know, one thing I like to discuss a lot is that um, when you when you look at the financials, and, uh, then and the, and you're about to close, the question is a lot is that you have usually you have a cash balance on that on on the balance sheet. And the question is what happens to that cash balance, right? Let's say you have a million dollars in the bank account. What happens to that million dollars? Does that get transferred out into the new owners, or does that or or is the seller entitled to that cash at the end? Those are things like that need to be discussed up front and should be documented in the LOI. It comes up all the time. And you want to make sure that not only, for instance, liabilities are transferred free and clear, but what about cash? Maybe the balance sheet is transferred free and clear. Again, things to negotiate in the LOI. Have your transaction advisor really help you negotiate that LOI so that issues don't come up and hold you back later on. One other piece I like to discuss here is really the diligence and the timing. Um, but once you sign that, once you execute that LOI, uh, usually there's a no shop in place. The question is, what does that mean from a seller's perspective, and how long does that mean? 
the, the buyer might have a quality of earnings that he or she wants to perform. They might have some other diligence and you, you know, you negotiated that diligence time. So the question is how much, how long of that period should that be before you can actually show um, the investment, the, the opportunity to somebody else. Again, things that need to be documented, things you should think about, and more importantly, things that you should discuss and negotiate before you sign and execute an LOI. And just as we mentioned with regard to the uh, NDA, it's very important that there be uh, provisions that, uh, that, that, that keep uh, certain obligations um, binding. Even if there's no obligation to proceed with the transaction, it's non-binding in that sense. There's no penalty uh, for terminating uh, for, for, for terminating it, it, it is important to keep confidentiality in place. So we want to talk, before we move to due diligence, I did want to say one more thing. I do think um, Hillel made a very important point. I just want to underscore it. Uh, what we find is that the signing, the, often uh, uh, buyer, uh, sellers are very excited to get to a letter of intent because it's an action step. It means that it, it looks like the transaction is moving forward. But one of the important things that, that sellers need to keep in mind, as Hillel commented, is that there is a shift in the balance of power in the transaction from the moment that an LOI is signed because all of a sudden the buyers are now holding sort of the keys to uh, the kingdom in a sense and deciding whether – uh, uh, the, the, the terms that need to be uh, fulfilled for uh, due diligence, for the elimination of contingencies, are satisfied. And we see so many deals uh, falter because of that imbalance of power and a lot of sellers who are sort of left standing at the altar. So uh, it's very important, I would say, for sellers to get good advice, to really have done their homework and make sure that their, the LOI is actually well-grounded um, and that there aren't sort of hidden issues because otherwise you may be getting the excitement of a prospective deal only to be sitting around uh, for a long time waiting. Right. We wanted to talk about the due diligence process. I mentioned on the earlier slide uh, that diligence has become, regulatory compliance and diligence has become a huge, huge issue. So diligence is a place where as lawyers we often uh, uh, are, are, you know, take a heightened role. And, and diligence is essentially the process by which the buyers can ensure that they are not buying um, unexpected headaches, that the facility has been operating appropriately, that it has the licenses that it needs to have, it's been paying the taxes it needs to pay, uh, and that there aren't any surprises. This is really critical territory, and it's territory that's changed substantially, I would say, over the, over the 25 years I've been practicing, and particularly in the last decade, we have seen this change not only in behavioral health, but especially in behavioral health, uh, meaning that there is a lot of fear out there. Uh, whenever you see negative media coverage about different fraud and abuse issues, whether it's lab relationships, whether it's uh, uh, clawbacks from insurance companies, whether it's law enforcement investigations of marketing and kickbacks, those are the kind of, of skeletons that buyers are afraid of and that kill deals. Uh, and so when the diligence process is going on, some of it may seem fairly uh, uh, ordinary, but there's a larger issue uh, kind of overlying the diligence process, which is the buyer's fear that they are buying um, a headache that they would be better off passing on. So just to go through some of the core issues of what happens in the regulatory diligence period, um, generally there's a lot of, there's a need to go through organizational information or was the, the entity, or as in the case of an opco propco, there could be two, multiple entities operating, or in the case of an entity that's for delivering professional services, there could be professional corporations and management entities. Looking at those entities, have they respected the corporate formalities? Have they made the necessary filings and kept their documentation up to date? That becomes very important because the protection for the company against liability, against prospective lawsuits, uh, is often based on compliance with these corporate responsibilities. Then, of course, you have all of the essential financial information that has to be provided. This is supporting the cash flows, the, 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 the appropriate uh, booking and accounting of, of, of the finances of the company, um, getting to, you know, the payment of taxes. And I'll add to there is that, you know, how, what, what do your ARs look like, right? So you have AR sitting on, on your balance sheet. And the question is, are they 90 days in arrears? Are they 120? At some point, they're going to be discounted. And so buyers want to see that up front to know that, hey, really you're not value at X, really your multiple is not X because you have all these, all these accounts receivables in arrears that, you know, depending where they fall in network, out of network, you're going to receive or you're not going to receive. So, and then you get into all these uh, uh, regulatory issues, licensing with the various 
uh, state agencies uh, with the programs like we have uh, DHCS, which is the California Medi-Cal program, uh, accreditations, right? Uh, uh, do you have all the sort of necessary licensing certification and accreditations that you need to operate and regulatory compliance, right? Have you, do you have, are, are there issues around um, your compliance with all of the various requirements that uh, apply to your program? Um, and I, I can't stress enough, we, we see a real variance in how much diligence is done, right? In a situation where a, a transaction is taking place that's a distress transaction, this is obviously going to be, uh, you know, people are, are, a buyer is coming in and buying as is, uh, and, and there'll be less diligence. But on a, on, a, on a large transaction, we are seeing an unprecedented level of analysis, of use of outside companies, uh, companies like FTI and other uh, consulting groups that come in and do the analysis. Uh, really combing through thousands and tens of thousands of pages of documentation, looking for those, looking for problems, and asking to explain um, at a very at a de level of detail how was what was the level of compliance around data privacy, the billing and coding, the delivery of different services, the supervision of the professionals. Uh, there, there's there is a uh, you should at this point in 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 the the in the cycle of of M and A and behavioral health. You should expect that this is going to be a, a, a focal point, um, which means that if you have, it, it really has huge implications for how you run your program. Uh, it is a uh, if you if you're if you're trying to figure out how to prepare for a transaction, it's absolutely critical that the groundwork be laid and that the first time that you be thinking about these issues not be when you hit the diligence phase, right? If it, it, often these issues historically looked like um, just a cost of doing business and a kind of a uh, an unnecessary uh, burden. Nobody got excited about uh, compliance issues. And, and what's changed is that these issues have become the driver because of all the fear that's out there. Um, other diligence issues to think about litigation risks, right? Are there potential claims on the horizon? Um, nothing can kill a deal faster than a new discovery of a problem, uh, uh, whether it's with a health insurance company or with a, um, a patient harm incident. Um, those risks need to be uh, disclosed. Um, lots of issues to look at in terms of the workforce. You know, are you complying with uh, 1099W2 employee classification issues? Independent, independent contractor issues has become a bigger, much bigger issue, uh, particularly here in California, as a result of changes in the laws. Are, are you? Do you have any kind of risks around your employees? Are there? Have you? Uh, do you have? Do you have any kinds of? Of, uh, of risk that is going to be uh, with respect to benefit plans, uh, of vacation policies, any kind of non-compliance on, on the employment issues not related to health care. Um, finally, we're seeing a growing diligence list, more attention to information technology. Do you, have the, uh, do you have a disaster recovery plan, which is a requirement under HIPAA? Do you have uh, uh, infrastructure for telecommunications? And the critical issue that we keep coming back to throughout this talk of insurance contracts. Right. By the way, this is a huge issue. Are the do you, what contracts do you have, and will they transfer? Often, the decision about the issue we were talking a few moments ago about the uh, stock sale, per, uh, equity sale versus a, a purchase versus a uh, uh, asset purchase, is really comes down to will the contracts transfer? It's very, very important to actually read your contract. I can tell you from a personal experience, these contracts are not cookie cutter at all. They change substantially. Uh, um, they're, and they're not, they're, it's not, they're not carefully written with respect to what has to happen when there is a change of ownership. Um, and it's very, very important to, to understand these. And particularly if you're a seller, you want to know if you have something that you can transmit or if this is going to require the blessing of the insurance company. I've, we've had deals where we had to get on the phone with senior people in the insurance companies in order to give buyers confidence that the, uh, that the, the, health, that the, health, the health plan was perfectly prepared to honor the transaction. We've had transactions where notice was given and advanced conversations were taking place with buyers. That has become a regular part of the landscape for behavioral health M&A, which is really unusual. It's not something that happened in the past. Um, and then other issues that come up in diligence, you know, all the contracts that are out there for with vendors, for uh, uh, property, um, leases, you know, with landlords, if, if there's, if, you know, those, those are such a huge issue. Uh, outside lab contracts are, uh, uh, we can spend the whole hour talking about all the compliance issues around those. So these are all the components that make up the diligence process. Um, and finally, um, the, the sort of the, 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 the core issue, which has always been part of diligence, which is verifying the financial performance of the facility. Right. So, I mean, we just we touched on one before. Just the AR aging is probably the biggest piece in this financials. Assuming you have historical financials, 
AR aging is going to be huge. So, so if you think you're going to, you know, base your multiple off of AR aging, you might want to think again, depending on how long that, that has left. Uh, what is collectability? Is it greater than 90 days? So just be able to answer that, be able to stand by as to why you think it might be or might not be, and be ready to take a haircut uh, for some. Um, just one other that I'll add, uh, you know, we'll just touch on this briefly, is the census detail. Now, uh, I, I don't think detailed census, need, detailed census needs to be given out right away, but I do think is that uh, and when I say right away, I mean prior to the signing of an LOI. I think a lot of it will come up in diligence. But the information that, that is important is the percentages. That comes up a lot. Any involuntary discharges, you need to get in front of that right away and explain why that happened. Very important as to the census, and that will be a hurdle that you'll have to answer to uh, if that comes up. Um, you know, just in the essence of time, we'll kind of move forward a little bit, a little bit faster here. Uh, the next. The next piece I want to quickly talk about is the quality of earnings. Um, and this, again, should be negotiated in the letter of intent. Uh, the quality of, your, of earnings is done with an external auditor, usually, and they might have their own timings. Make sure you understand that uh, ahead of time so that uh, you can bake that into the, in, into the LOI. Um, it, so uh, you know, I'll mention one more piece about the quality of earnings. Uh, we, we, had a, we had this in one of our transactions is that it actually held up. We were 45 days into the contract, um, no shop clause, ended at 45 days, and we have yet, we yet to receive the quality of earnings. We actually received it on day 46. Okay, so it wasn't a big deal, but that does come up because, again, you're dealing with outside counsel, dealing with outside uh, auditors, and that can hold up. That's not a seller's issue. But it needs to be, it, it needs to be uh, that point needs to be drive home to the buyer uh, in the LOI that we're not going to wait for those auditors. So the buyer really needs to hit home and say, hey, uh, auditor, hey, accounting firm, we have a limited time here. You got to be hit the ground running, okay, for quality of earnings. And I would just, this is another place like compliance where if you're a seller, the message that you should take away from this is you've got to do the homework in advance because you can't have buyers sitting around uh, waiting for information on that. So we wanted to get to definitive documentation. You actually finally, you, you've gotten uh, all the way and you're actually ready to put together the agreement itself. Um, one, one thing to focus on here is that uh, um, there's some money that gets sunk into a deal, whether it goes forward or not, right? You, uh, unfortunately, uh, as a lawyer, uh, um, you know, one of the biggest uh, challenges that comes up is uh, the cost of, of, of lawyers to negotiate, to structure, and put a deal together um, and that is a sunk cost. So it is, um, it's, again, this is a reason to do the homework up front and, uh, and to be prepared. It, you know, if you're rushing into a deal as a seller uh, or, um, and you, you, could, you could very well be unnecessarily spending money putting together um, a, a, a agreements only to find out that there isn't a market uh, or a buyer out there for your deal. Um, and there are always, um, the issue comes up of earnest money or is there some amount that's going to be deposited um, and, and uh, in advance, it's going to be paid to the seller, uh, even if the buyer walks away, and breakup fees. This has become a huge issue. Gen generally, there is a specific fee that's, uh, uh, that's set up for, um, you know, when will one party or the other be responsible for all of these costs, the legal fees, which, again, are not only drafting the agreements, but the diligence process. Literally, uh, it's not unusual to see these, the, the legal fees be in the tens of thousands or even in, get into the hundreds of thousands of dollars on a big transaction. And so identifying when there has been some reason for one side or the other to be responsible, is it a, 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 a no, no cause or a for cause breakup, meaning something was not disclosed, something was not done appropriately, um, or the buyer walked away without, for, for a legitimate reason or for, an, uh, uh, for, for not having a, a supportable reason, is going to lead to specific financial penalties. That becomes a major, major issue, often reaching into the millions and tens of millions of dollars. Um, critical terms in the definitive documentation become the reps and warranties. The representations and warranties, these are the, the promises that each side is making to another, and particularly that the seller in a deal is, is assuring the buyer, right? So anytime something hasn't been disclosed and, something, uh, and, then, and the buyer discovers after the fact that there's a problem, it means that there's been a breach of a representation and warranty, and that becomes a basis of liability. So those, that's a, those are critical terms. And finally, um, understanding the, uh, how the transaction itself is going to work 
with the change of ownership process. There are a lot of, we often as a, a regulatory firm, are, we sometimes we do both sides of a deal, the, the transaction itself and the diligence um, and, the, and the post transaction change of ownership. Often there'll be a, a, a general firm that is a, really focused on the deal and bringing in specialists to just do the diligence and the change of ownership. It's important to understand that those are different things that there are lots of law firms out there that can do the deals, but you also need to make sure that you have somebody who understands the diligence, who really, which requires an understanding of the industry and the regulatory issues uh, and the change of ownership process. Um, and we should talk a little bit more about the change of ownership process. So uh, I mentioned it earlier, the change of ownership process uh, refers not in both to the licensing and also to the, um, uh, to the sometimes to the uh, uh, provider agreements like Medicare and, Med and and uh, uh, Medicare. So as with insurance contracts, it's a very important issue. Is the license transferable? Uh, for example, here in California, uh, there is there are certain licenses that are not transferable. There is no process in California, for example, for transferring the license for an adult residential treatment program, which means that as soon as 51% of the license transfers from the, uh, uh, from the seller to the buyer, that license is canceled and the seller needs a new license. Right, so there's no, in some cases, when you look at other more longstanding parts of the industry, when you look at adolescent group homes, for example, there's a very defined process for how that happens. Uh, but what often is necessary is to have some interim management agreement where a buyer essentially buys the, uh, the, the, the program from the seller who holds the license uh, and, then the, and then instantly leases it back after the transaction for whatever period of time it takes for the licensing to be completed by the buyer because now the buyer finally owns the facility and they are permitted by state agencies to proceed with the, uh, with the application for licensure. But in the interim, the seller is going to continue to operate it with the financial benefit going to the uh, buyer. Often the buyer will be managing and controlling it, but it will still be taking place under, uh, under, under seller's license. This is a very complicated process that requires specialized counsel and needs to be done in careful compliance with the, with the laws of the particular state. So do you want to talk about the closing and post-closing? Uh, um, I, I was in, I, I think we should, do, should we do one more? One more? The, the, the so just a, yeah. a couple of comments on the clo closing and post-closing. So the closing is the moment of truth in the deal. Uh, the deal is actually going forward. The deal funds. Uh, uh, buyer actually advances the funds uh, as soon as documents are finalized and all closing conditions are, um, are signed. So generally there's a, you know, in many transactions there will be a gap. The parties will sign the purchase agreement and there will still be additional conditions to closing that may take days or weeks to complete. And then there will be a formal uh, a transfer that occurs upon those conditions being satisfied and then a formal funding. So again, this process is you can, you can sign a purchase agreement and the deal is still not completely done uh, until these steps take place. It's just important to remember there's a long process here and a lot of places for things to get caught up. We wanted to leave people with some final thoughts, uh, uh, and we're happy to take questions, but um, uh, we wanted to leave you with some sort of high-level uh, things to think about uh, from this presentation today. Uh, I'll start with just a, a, a transactional readiness, which we talked about at the very beginning, is really essential. What we're saying here is that for buyers, it is absolutely critical to do your homework, sorry, for sellers, to do your homework uh, and to make sure to really understand what you're doing uh, before you head into the sale process and start actually uh, uh, presenting your program to prospective buyers. And it's also a test of your organizational health. Having your documentation, your ducks in a row, having strong financials to support quality of earnings, these are all things that should not, you shouldn't learn those along the way in the deal process. You have to know those up front, and that is what the transaction is about. Uh, you know, I'll leave you with three points. Uh, you, you have what's written here, but I'll leave you with three points of, of my final thoughts. Uh, which are related here as well. It's really first is understanding, understanding what is driving value. That's very important, right? As a seller, know what, what your advantages are. Um, there's some additional ones listed here, but but what I'll add here is that under, again, understanding what is driving your value. Engage experienced advisors and deal counsel. That will really help you get through the processes. It's very important. And finally. So make sure you keep managing as an owner. That's very important. 
So let's go through these. Yeah. Just, I, I, I know you, you want to jump, but let me, I want uh, yeah. just another critical point besides understanding what, what's driving value, limiting internal information about sale efforts to a need to know few. You know, as somebody who, I, I'm a person who really values transparency, this is a situation where transparency works against you as a seller, and you really need to control the flow of information and be discreet simply because of the nature of this uh, uh, of this information that you're considering a sale to be destabilizing inside your organization. Um, another important point is trying to avoid negotiating serially, meaning you don't want to just go through the process as a seller and talk to a prospective buyer and then, uh, and then talk to a different buyer. You, in order to test the market, you really want to have, uh, be working with, with, uh, with, with somebody who can help you get the deal out there to the right uh, prospective buyers and you want to uh, have it, you, you want to have your your this the deal shopped, not to the whole world, but selectively and discreetly to a number of buyers at once to create a market. There's a real danger of only looking at one deal at a time, and this is a mistake that many many sellers make. Uh, um, and uh, and as we've talked about in this program too many times, buyers are quick to sign an, a letter of intent, and then and then uh, everything slows down because the buyer is holding all the cards, and they're slow to move to close. We've, uh, I've said here several times in this presentation, and we'll just emphasize it here, very important to have deal counsel who understand uh, be not only the process but behavioral health. These deals are different uh, just because of all of the external factors and the way that the industry is changing. Uh, Hilla, you, you were about to talk about managing expectations. Yeah, so so we, we mentioned before that there's the no shop clause and always having a plan B, but make sure that, again, you want to make sure you choose the right buyer. You might have a strategic buyer. You might have a financial buyer but don't jump, right? Make sure that you have the right counsel in place. And also you can have a plan B in place as well, right? No shop doesn't mean that prior to signing, you can say, hey, we have a list if this falls through. But understand that usually comes with a concession of a fee or not. Um, and, and last one is keep managing as an owner. I, I think this is probably the, one of the most important points here on this slide is that you're not done until things are signed and even then you're not done. So make sure, don't let the business go south make sure you keep on managing as an owner. And just on these, on these last two points, I just want to underscore, um, you know, the worst, uh, we, we often are seeing, we are seeing a lot of uh, distress-based deals, and those are great for a certain kind of buyer who's, a, uh, who, who's learned to thrive in that market. Those are not good situations for sellers. And the time to be thinking about a sale is before you're in a problem situation. Your ability to have a plan B is predicated on uh, having the option of saying no to a deal and walking away from a deal as a seller. Um, and, and that's why this is so, so important. Um, there are, we're seeing incredible deals that are still happening, but the market has been incredibly volatile um, and uh, so many transactions uh, start down the process, but you, it can often be a six to eight month process, uh, in some cases even longer, uh, where deals don't get closed. And so, You've got to keep managing and, and focus on keeping your program healthy uh, and getting through those difficult moments while uh, being hopeful of a deal getting done. So uh, we're happy if there are questions. We're more than happy to take them. Uh, we hope uh, that, uh, the, that this program has been uh, valuable and has provided you with information to think more carefully about the deal process. Um, we put on one of the early slides, this is really an unfolding story. We are seeing a time of profound transformation, not only in how behavioral health services are delivered and how they're regulated, but also in, how, in terms of how the uh, programs are being uh, bought, sold, uh, uh, getting investment and refinancing, and there is, uh, um, there's a lot to the story. So uh, we're thrilled to provide this update and want to thank everybody for listening today. And of course, feel free to email Harry or myself with any questions. Um, we're happy to answer uh, anything that comes up from a buyer's perspective, a seller's perspective. Uh, we're around and happy to answer. And uh, not, not seeing any questions, we are going to close this program. Thank you so much for listening in. Uh, on behalf of uh, Nelson Hardiman, Adaptive Health Capital, and uh, uh, Behavioral Health Association providers, we're uh, thrilled to be able to provide this program today. Thank you so much.